got to work with many of the people in the room in Colorado on the election reform we passed in 2013, and it's uh, something that all of you have a passion. Many of you have many passions, uh, whether it be education, whether it be health care, uh, all of them are tied into election reform in some way, shape, or form. If you can't, if people can't vote and hear that have their voices heard, then they're not truly represented and their issues are not represented in uh, the legislature and in their states. This year we saw policies of voter suppression across the board, both actively in the field, but also policies uh, like voter ID and purging and reducing locations. It was the first presidential election without the NVRA in full force. And we had 868 fewer polling locations across the country, most of those in states that are, were covered by the NVRA. So at six, we've been helping fight back those, uh, those negative issues across the board, but also proactively, we've been working uh, to affect reform in the states. Uh, we've been working on automatic voter registration in many states. And we've been working on uh, policies that extend uh, uh, opportunities to vote from home, uh, expanded mail ballot access, early vote uh, locations, and such. We have a policy playbook uh, that we're just revising right now and we'll be sending out after the conference on automatic voter registration that will help uh, you with your policies in your states and also your messaging. Um, and we, uh, today's panelists will be talking about several different things as it relates to election reform. So first today, we're going to hear from Oregon uh, Senator Sarah Gelsler. Uh, she was instrumental in passing AVR in Oregon. And um, we'll be reporting out on some of the results of that implementation and also the process by which it was passed. Next, we'll hear from my good friend Andrew Bauman. Uh, Andrew has been conducting extensive research on helping move AVR in your states and uh, we'll be providing some of that research to you, some of the messaging that's important. And in addition to being an amazing pollster and good friend, he lives two, door two, two doors down from my mom, so uh, that's always nice as well. Uh, next we'll be hearing from former Oregon Secretary of State Phil Kiesling. Uh, in addition to being Secretary of State um, when they pushed through mail ballot elections and he was Secretary of State from 91 through 99, um, he is a scholar and uh, director of the Center for Public Service at Portland State University. And he'll be talking about the impact of those policies uh, uh, for voter participation and voting at home and the impact of those policies. Wrapping up the panel, we'll be hearing from Vermont Senator-elect Chris Pearson about efforts to pass national popular vote. Uh, with Hillary Clinton surpassing 2.5 million vote lead in the popular vote, this effort is likely to be top of mind with all of you and he'll be talking about his effort in Vermont and also the broader effort throughout the country. Following all four speakers, we'll be uh, having questions and answers from all of you, and we'll have mics uh, moving out through the room to have Q&A. With that, I will turn it over to you, Senator. Thank you very much, and can you hear me okay out there? All right, well, I come from Oregon where we really like to vote, and I come with really good news. Uh, this past year, we had the smallest number of unregistered eligible voters in our state in over 20 years, in spite of the fact that our population had grown by 30%. We've cut our unregistered uh, voter population by nearly half. The result of that, that's pretty exciting, isn't it? The result of that is that in this election, over 2 million Oregonians voted. That's 67% of Oregonians 18 and older that are eligible to vote cast a ballot. They weren't just registered, 67% of the people who were eligible to vote cast a ballot, and that's up 5% from 2012. So how did we do this? It was through automatic voter registration and the follow-up through that. Getting there was a, a bit of a journey, and fortunately, uh, in this Oregon process, there were many mothers to the success. Two of them are in the room, uh, Senate Majority Leader Diane Rosenbaum, who was our Senate Majority Leader at the time, and House Majority Leader Jennifer Williamson, who shepherded these bills through their Rules Committee, and of course, our extraordinary governor, Governor Kate Brown, who introduced this bill first while she was Secretary of State. The idea of making sure that the simple idea that every citizen has a right to vote 
to make decisions about how their communities are built was incredibly exciting to me. It, it is a nonpartisan idea, it is a basic idea, it is a democratic idea. So in the 2013 session, when we voted on this in the House, the day after the, the voter rights legislation was gutted, by the Supreme Court, it was a, a, a high point. I remember Representative Lou Frederick, who's a new senator, was here, gave a beautiful speech that day about the importance of this legislation. And I eagerly walked over from my desk in the House to sit on the Senate floor to watch us enact this historic legislation. We had 16 Democrats in the Senate, and when the vote tallied up, it failed. 15 votes to 15 votes. And that was the point at which I decided that I was running for the state Senate, because we needed one more vote to make sure that every Oregonian got to use their vote. So I was very grateful to be one of two new legislators in the 2014 session. We won back two seats from the Republican caucus. This was one of the first bills that we passed. It was the first bill that Governor Kate Brown signed, and it, it felt really good. So what is it? It's really simple. When you go to the DMV to get an ID card, or uh, a driver's license or a driver's permit, you are automatically registered to vote if you're eligible. Of course, you could always go to the DMV and do that, but it was an opt-in. This is you have to opt out. You get a card in the mail. You can say, hey, I don't want to be a voter. Uh, with that card in the mail, you can choose a party. Most of these new voters have not chosen to register with a party. They are non-affiliated voters. And we know because we went back and recaptured all of those individuals that were eligible that had gone to the DMV in 2014 and 2015, over half of them had not opted in to vote. So we know that this absolutely works. The outcome was really incredible. There were over, we registered nearly a quarter of a million new voters as a result of this. And because of their turnout in the fall election, 97,184 Oregonians that would not have otherwise voted cast their ballots. That is really, truly extraordinary. There was a 400% increase in new DMV registrations. And prior to the implementation of automatic voter registration, we averaged about 808, or we averaged about 2,000 new voters a month registered in Oregon. After we passed automatic voter registration, we were averaging 808 per day, per day. That is a lot of, of voters. Now, we didn't just stop at registering these voters. We know that they also needed to participate. Some of these uh, voters had, obviously, they weren't registered. They hadn't participated. So an extraordinary organization in Oregon called the Oregon Bus Project, led by a remarkable young woman that everyone should pay attention to and remember her name, Nikki Fisher, uh, ran this voter contact process. They went out. It was nonpartisan. They got volunteers to sign up to go talk to lists of new voters in their neighborhood. They talked to them to get information about who they were, what they were concerned about in their communities, and also to help them understand how the vote by mail process works. Uh, they, in the general, sent out 44,000 uh, lit pieces about the civic duty to cast your vote, 133,000 pieces about step-by-step -step how to vote by mail in Oregon. And the result of that was extraordinary. Among all new automatic uh, voter registrants, about 43% turned out. But among those that were contacted, that had this person-to-person follow-up that said, we care about you and your vote, nonpartisan, just neighbors going out, that number doubled, uh, not doubled, went up by nearly 20 points, 61%. That is absolutely extraordinary. And to states that are looking at doing this, I think that piece of the implementation is incredibly important. How do you, look, how do you um, engage these voters? So moving forward, I think we have a number of opportunities. How do we continue to engage these voters? How do we make sure that we're still registering people that are not going to the DMV in order to get IDs? For instance, individuals with disabilities who often aren't driving. We also have to look at the, the threats and the objections to the law. Uh, just this week, one of the first ballot measures for 2018 was filed in Oregon by a colleague of mine uh, named Mike Nierman. Um, this would be a tremendous threat to our voter participation because it would require a constitutional amendment, would require every person currently registered to vote in Oregon to re-register within two years of that implementation. This is the reason why he's doing it. And I quote, 
I've heard rumors of what went on in House District 22, which is Woodburn and North Salem, that there was heavy recruiting and voter registration drives among populations of Latinos that are likely to have a lot of illegal aliens, Nierman said last week in a phone interview. I don't have my doubts that is going on at least at some level. And I know what happened in House District 22. We elected Representative Teresa Alonso Leon, who I believe is in the room, and she won by 10 points. <laughs> so we need to be pushing back against this, protecting that basic right for every Oregonian that is eligible to vote to get that ballot in their hand and vote. In a few minutes, uh, Phil is gonna talk a little bit about Oregon's vote by mail. These two pieces work together incredibly well. The overall voter turnout in Oregon uh, among registered voters was 80%. 80% is a really fantastic number if you think about what the election looked like across the country. And the reason that that works is we put that ballot in the hands of people where they are at. We have taken down the barriers to registering to vote, and now you can sit at your kitchen table with your family and vote. That means that elderly people can vote. People that can't get off work can vote. People with disabilities can vote. Uh, you can't be shut out to vote because of a long line at your polling place. It is an extraordinary thing that I really urge all states to do. So thank you so much for allowing uh, me to come and share a little bit of the good news of, of Oregon. It's a privilege to talk about it. Again, there are so many um, mothers and fathers of this success, and I really look forward to seeing this implemented across the country. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, as Sean mentioned, my name is Andrew Bauman. I am a um, senior Vice President at Global Strategy Group. Um, we, along with the Patinkin Research Strategies, have been conducting uh, polling for the Center for Secure and Modern Elections all throughout the, uh, the year. Uh, looking at a broad issue of, uh, of voting rights issues, but most specifically looking at AVR, and really trying to understand how to message about AVR in a way that resonates with the public in order to build support uh, for passing this in more state and for defending it from uh, certain attacks like Sarah was mentioning. Um, so. Can we get the slides up, Sean? They're up. Perfect. Okay. So let me just start here uh, with how AVR is viewed. And this, these results are from a survey we did back in January uh, nationwide. Um, we read voters a sort of longer description of an AVR proposal, as, as uh, Sarah just sort of outlined it. Um, and you see overall support was at 78%. Now this is on the high end of our, uh, of our results in our various polls. It's fluctuated between about 63 and 75%, uh, depending on how you uh, uh, describe it. Um, but the important thing I wanna point out here is that the support is broad, but it's not very intense. You see that 44% of voters are in that somewhat support area, support area. So this is an idea that has a lot of broad bipartisan support off the, off the top of a, you know, at the beginning when, when voters don't know much about it. Uh, Democrats, independents, Republicans, strong majorities of each like it, but they're not intense about it. Um, and really some of that soft support, particularly from center-right voters, those are the voters we sort of need to keep with us if we want to hold a majority in favor of AVR, which we certainly can do. Um, but there are messages from the other side uh, that are, um, a lot of it is, is demagoguing, but you know, that can resonate if we don't do what we need to do to push back on that. Um, so that's one really pr um, priority for us is in sort of pushing uh, AVRs, is really shoring up that, that swing vote, that center-right vote. The other is building intensity in our own base, the progressive base. Um, I would, one of the things I want to note here is that the, there's a lot of intense support among Hispanics, but it's actually lower among African Americans than you might expect. And that's another thing we found in our research is that uh, African Americans are a very important target for building intensity of support. They're, they're not in danger of sort of moving away from us, but they, we need to, to, to talk to them to get them more excited about AVR and the similar reforms. So uh, in, in one of the things we did in a survey in Virginia that we conducted a little more recently is we read a series of, of items um, that might be included in an AVR proposal, um, either specific policy items or sort of descriptions of, of things that it does. And I think that, that there are a couple things here that are really important to note. First, um, the, the top two items here had to do with the integrity and security of elections. Now, now uh, we know that the other side um, is, uh, pushes these voter fraud myths that are not true. But at the same time, we know that voters are worried about the integrity and security of elections. And that's one of the potential vulnerabilities of AVR is if the other side can convince voters that this is going to make um, uh, elections more, less secure. But 
thankfully, we have messaging on our own side to not only push back from that, on that but inoculate. And you know, when we tell voters that AVR includes the creation or the use of an existing secure database to, for instance, uh, maintain accurate list of eligible voters or make sure that only eligible citizens are registered, you see 73 or 75 percent of voters say that this is an excellent or good idea. That's the number one thing that they like the most about AVR, enhancing security. The next thing that they like the most is sort of modernization and updating an outdated system. This just makes inherent sense to voters. You know, we do everything online these days. No, we don't do anything by paper. We bank, we, you know, whatever. And so the idea that we're still sort of using this outdated paper-based system doesn't make sense. So talking about an update or a modernization of the system uh, is inherently good for them. Um, one thing that's not on here, because we've tested it separately, but is also very popular, is the, the point that it's portable. That not only are you automatically registered, but with AVR, that if you ever move, your update, your, your registration will be updated for you automatically, and that's also very popular. Excuse me. So uh, one of the things we did uh, very early in the year is we, we, we did online discussion boards to sort of get a qualitative sense about what voters thought about uh, registration generally and AVR specifically. And we read them a similar proposal. And before we even gave them any sort of uh, you know, um, ideas about what they might like or what not like, we asked them, um, what's the best reason to support this proposal? We just read them the proposal, didn't do anything else, and what's the best reason? And the things that came back are just the things that I just mentioned. It was about uh, the, just eliminating paper, making it more efficient, efficient um, modernization. That, and, and, and voters sort of mentioned this in a couple different um, dimensions. First of all, they thought it made sense just generically. But second of all, they said that that would, that would cost, save, uh, save governments money. They thought that that would make the, the system more secure and have more integrity, and it would reduce government bureaucracy. So even before we sort of messaged to them, they sort of thought that just this sort of update and modernization would have uh, positive impacts on the cost front, on the security front, and on the government front. And particularly center-right voters, that's really important to them. Now, when we actually start testing messages, a few things do pop out as, as sort of uh, at the top. One is cost and efficiency. You can sort of see that at the bottom here. This, these are the list of the top testing messages of a bunch of about 15 or 20 that we tested. That's important. Um, but the, the other things that are really important, first, a values message about protecting the fundamental right of eligible Americans to participate in our democracy and to have their voice heard and their vote counted. That's sort of the core message here. Uh, the values message of protecting that fundamental right to vote. And one thing we've seen is that when you put in the context, give the example of sort of a military family um, uh, uh, that has sort of moved around or been, maybe been overseas and hasn't been able to keep up a registration, that gives a really good clear-cut example of, of, you know, how this, the kind of people that this could impact, uh, and obviously is, is an example that voters across the political spectrum um, have a lot of respect for. So that's number one. Number two is a security message, and this was the top testing message among center-right voters, who again are sort of our key target here. And one of the things we've really struggled with over the course of this year is we know we have to talk about security and integrity, but we don't want to play into the other side's frame about voter fraud and systems being insecure, about voter Donald Trump saying millions of people and eligible people voted because we know that's wrong and we don't want to perpetuate that. Um, so we've been sort of trying to figure out what's the right balance to have a message that really resonates without uh, going too far. And one of the things we found in the survey is you don't have to talk about the fact that it'll, it'll prevent um, ineligible people from taking advantage of a system that's broken and doesn't work. You don't have to go there at all. You can just say that uh, by modernizing, modernizing our registration system, this proposal will help make sure that eligible voters and only eligible voters are able to cast ballots. You can see that 49% of center-right voters thought that was a very convincing reason to support the proposal, number one um, message tested. And then the other thing I want to point out here really quickly is a small change. Now, one of the things we've seen in our polling is that voters actually think the system works pretty well. Um, you know, they, they, in messages where we try to talk about how many people don't participate, how many barriers there are, it really, even though I think we all agree that that's sort of true, it doesn't resonate with voters, it doesn't meet them where they are. And the other thing is, particularly for center-right voters, when you talk too much about making it easy to vote, they don't really like that. They think that it's appropriate for there to be some barriers and that people should you know, be, be have to take some kind of responsibility on their own to actually go and vote. So having a message that this is just a small change, it's just a sort of an update of a system that works pretty well, you, know, you, you still must be a citizen, you still must live in Virginia in order to vote. All this proposal does is help those who are eligible to vote get registered. It doesn't force them to vote. They still have to take personal responsibility to have their voice heard. 
That's a really important message for those center-right voters too. So our latest research we conducted in September um, was actually trying to understand how the, the recent, uh, you know, with the, the presidential election, the focus on hacking, Russian hacking, but also um, Donald Trump's claim of, claims of voter fraud, particularly continuing to be relevant now, how that might impact uh, views on AVR. Um, do we have to worry that this kind of messages could be used again from, by our opponents to undermine support for AVR? Um, and what we found, and I'll show you in a second, is that um, there, you know, there are some attacks from the other side that, that can, can hurt us, but we have messages too when we basically can fight this to a draw. But not only that, that we can position AVR as something that will help protect from some of these issues that uh, people are worried about. But really the most effective messages when it comes to these kind of, kind of attacks about voter fraud, and about hacking, talk, um, sort of move back to that sort of modernization frame, that this is a modernization, uh, an update of, of an outdated system that's gonna help protect from potential hacking or from voter fraud by making it easier for election officials to catch that, uh, making our voter list more accurate, making sure we're sort of more plugged in with what's going on. Um, so again, sort of that modernization frame, really important to push back on those kind of attacks. And I thought the most interesting thing from this survey was, after we read voters' messages from our side and from the other side, we asked, all right, do you think AVR will have a positive or a negative impact on the security of our elections, on our ability to prevent voter fraud, and our ability to protect our election systems from hacking? And you can see here um, that a majority of voters, a strong majority, said it would have a positive impact on the first two and a strong plurality on the latter. So by no means do we think that, you know, folks should be out there saying that AVR is a panacea, it's going to protect us from all these things, that's, you know, that's going way too far. But AVR, there is an opportunity to sort of say, hey, we, you know, we are concerned about these issues, and one way we can help try to make sure that doesn't, you know, to help prevent this is by passing automatic voter registration and updating our outdated, outdated system. So sort of summarizing not only this, but all of the work we've done over the year, these are sort of our takeaways on how to talk about AVR um, across the political spectrum, both to our base and to those swing voters that are so important. First of all, as I mentioned, instead of highlighting problems, it's better to emphasize the need to modernize the registration process. It works pretty well, but could be improved. Um, like I said, voters don't perceive major problems with the system, and few outside of our base believe that participation or access is a fundamental problem, unfortunately. That's a larger issue we need to work on, but in the terms of AVR, it's true. Um, you know, we want to frame AVR as a common sense choice for moving our updated registration system forward, and also it's really important to try to keep this um, message sort of less inflamed, less pa actually ha inflaming less, fewer passions, and keeping it more nonpartisan. If we try to get into the, you know, if we try to make this about um, you know, participation, making sure it's easier to vote, then we really, those are sort of code words that kind of set off the other side's base. And if we avoid that, just talking about sort of an, a, a common sense update to the system, we don't really get their side's base inflamed either, which is important. Um, secondly, we must speak to security and integrity concerns. This is the one thing that can sink us. Uh, if the other side can make the case that AVR makes, it, makes voter fraud more likely, that's how we get beaten. But we have messages um, that we can, can use. We found that in Alaska where we won a, a, you know, a very conservative state where we won a ballot measure with 65% of the vote. Uh, it's, and and you know, what we want to talk about how this will protect the integrity of the system just by making sure that only eligible citizens are registered to vote. It, it's a, it uses a secure database that will keep lists accurate and updated and only eligible citizens will be registered. That's it, but, but that must be a core part of our message. Um, secondly, um, we should not, as I just mentioned, we should not shy away from promoting AVR as a part of the solution to hacking, fraud, and rigging, uh, again, through that modernization and updated frame. Um, but then really here, this, this uh, bottom part of this slide is really the core, our core message is sort of three compo components. First, by updating our outdated paper-based registration system, we're modernizing a system that otherwise works well. And there are two sort of sub-bullets there. Uh, first, that it will lead to, more, lead to a more efficient system and save taxpayers money. Uh, second, that is a small change and voters will have to, to take personal responsibility to vote. And then the core, as I mentioned, is this values message for the fundamental right, protecting the fundamental right of eligible Americans to participate in our democracy, be they Democrat, independent, or Republican. Um, and then the security message I just mentioned, protecting the integrity of our elections to help ensure that only eligible Americans are registered. And I'm not going to read this. Um, but on the next slide, we've actually sort of drafted some language that, that is our recommendation on how to talk about AVR. Uh, uh, the CSME, the Center for Secure and Modern Elections, uh, certainly would be happy to, to send this around to anybody that has an interest to, to see it.
that thank you very much. And we're integrating that language into our uh, policy playbook as well, so you'll be able to get access through that. Get the Good morning. My name is Phil Kieslings, uh, former Secretary of State uh, in the state of Oregon, and I'm here to talk about what I would call the more, even more powerful cousin or sibling to automatic voter registration. I love AVR. I was so proud when our state pioneered this reform too, and in 2016 we were the only state in the country to pair vote at home with automatic voter registration. But I'm going to make the case that as much as I love AVR, I think vote at home will have a, a two to three times the impact in a presidential race, and maybe triple, quadruple the impact in a midterm race, which of course we know are the kill, have been the killing fields for so many progressive dreams in recent years. So channel your inner John Lennon for a moment and imagine a state that doesn't have these things. Voters never have to deal with photo IDs, long lines, dealing with weather, kids at home working, where people have the time and aren't rushed so they can vote in all the races, including important state legislative races. And there are three states now that have this as their, as their election system. Here's the turnout in the 2014 election among active registered voters. We were not a battleground. Washington State didn't even have a Senate or a governor's contest on the ballot, one of a handful. And yet, look how we performed relative to the battleground states in 2014, and basically 17 points above the average across the country in active registered voters. Now, there's a simple but powerful concept that underpins the policy of a vote at home system. In 47 states, it's the voter's obligation to connect with his or her ballot. Now that means they either go to a traditional polling place on election day or prior where the ballots are dispensed, or they can apply for, they have to qualify for an absentee. Now some states make that easy, some states make it hard, a few states are making it easier, but only for certain kinds of voters. We'll just automatically let people over 65, for example, get an absentee ballot. Now, a fundamentally different principle underlies vote at home, and it is the governor, government's obligation to connect people with their ballot, every registered voter. And if you think about it, as Sarah made a, a great point, it is, it is also an opt-out system. The ballot shows up. They can decide to recycle it. And many do, particularly in local elections uh, and, and the like. But it is the default is sending it to the voter. So the purpose is to increase the odds that the already registered are actually going to consummate the voting act. And again. This is what it's about, getting people who are registered to actually just do it. Now, I love AVR. We pioneered it, as I mentioned. But let's put things in perspective. First, recognize the same policy principle underlies AVR. The government knows you're a citizen. It's the government's obligation to register you, OK? But, um, uh, uh, even in a presidential election, let's be honest about the effects. We had 100,000 more voters that voted. This is wonderful. But we only had, again, among the non-AVRs, we had an 82% turnout. And among the others, it was 43%. Now, Senator Gelser made a great point, is when you educate voters, you get them to 61% greater than the average turnout in a midterm election among all voters in the U.S. And it's an important thing. So in combination, this is great. But we think there would have been even fewer of those folks voting if it had not been for combining it with vote at home, and even fewer in those midterm elections. So we know that we've got some really powerful trends. We lost ground from 08 
in terms of only adding 3 million actual votes cast versus 18 million more eligible. In 2014, we fell from 91 to 83, and actually more active registered voters didn't cast a ballot in 2014 than did. That's only active registered. If you look at all registered, and this is a look that puts it in perspective. The bigger turnout problem is not getting the unregistered to the registration stage. Again, it's great. The real challenge is getting the already registered to actually vote. Now, it's important to understand voting, I think, as a discrete act in five stages. Getting registered, connecting with the ballot, marking it, and then eventually casting it. This is what the system looks like in most states. There is a big chasm between getting registered and actually casting a ballot. The presidential election is the only one, okay, that we even have a majority of eligible voters, uh, uh, citizens are casting a ballot. What Oregon does is it combines those stages one and two, so you automatically connect those to the ballots. And yes, you're separate now from when you actually mark it, most people do it at home, and how you return it. And by the way, most people don't return it through the mail anymore, they return it in person, because we have hundreds of drop sites set up. And while souls to the ballot drop sites doesn't quite have the ring to it, okay, you don't have to wait in lines, you don't have to go through a photo ID check, you just drop off your completed ballot. And here's what Oregon has done, is it taken those first three stages and combined them. What a powerful, powerful combination. So when voter turnout plummets, we know what happens to the electorate, okay? The median age gets significantly older. For 2014, it was about 54.5 versus 51 in 2012. And by the way, this is an aside, but the exit polls are so wrong about the median age of the electorate. If you go to those polls, you'd think that it was 47, it's actually closer to 51 or 52, and 54 and a half is from census data where 10 million more people claim to have voted than did, so it's probably even older. And we also know what happens in terms of the diversity of the electorate. So we've done a study now, it's ongoing at, uh, in my shop, 17 states, we've looked at complete voter files, and of those states, 18 to 34-year-old registered voters, this is what happened in 2014. Look how puny the turnout of 18 to 34-year-olds are in a midterm election, averaging about 22% in these states. We were over 45. And Colorado did really well, too. This is Latino registered voter turnout that Matt Barreto, a professor at UCLA, has done. He's not an advocate of, of, of vote at home, at least not yet. But only two states beat 50 percent, three states beat 50 percent, Colorado and Oregon were two of them. And again, we were not a battleground in 2014. Look at the average, again, in a midterm election. So I think our performance is even better than it appears. Because, oh, Oregon, you're New Hampshire on the Pacific. You're a bunch of white, rich, and well-educated people. Well, we'd like to think that maybe that's true, but it's actually not. We haven't been a battleground. Uh, uh, um, and we're swimming against some powerful demographic graphic currents. We're below average in income. Our education level isn't what it should be. Only 13 states have a larger Latino share of our population. Um, and, uh, and yet, look at how we are, we are performing uh, relative to the rest, of the rest of the country. We also, people raise the issue of fraud. My goodness. We've had, I think, 12 cases out of over 100 million mailed out ballots since we went full on to this system. I just read yesterday that four cases of documented voter fraud in 2016, and there were over 30 million ballots cast. Do not fall into the lazy argument that the problem with fraud is with mailed out absentee ballots. It's a non-existent problem, and we can fill you in more on that. Colorado's performance, by the way, even stronger. And they've added two things uh, to get this bill passed that I like. They've added voting centers, and they paired it with same-day registration. Not necessary, I'd argue, to get the f most of the benefits of vote at home, but a very powerful combination as well. So if you think about what we're doing, many reforms target this left end of the spectrum, the unregistered, the inactives, um, and they try to bring more in. 
and by doing so increase the number of people that are voting in all of these elections. But what we do with Vote at Home is target this part. The people that may not vote in the, in the, gen, uh, the midterm or, or much less the primary and occasionally vote in the presidential and tries to then expand that spectrum of voting. Again, both are powerful, but I would argue this is even more so. So how do we get it to happen? We did it through ballot measure. It's a tough sell. The messaging is important. Um, but I believe it can be done. And if you think about Ohio, Missouri, Florida, and, and Michigan, 72 electoral votes, you could get it on the ballot for maybe $4 million for signature gathering. And seven more Western states, including Nevada and Arizona, for less than two. And many of them have a lot of experience with this, this kind of system. You can also. You can also move up the ladder. If you just allow absentee for an excuse, make it no excuse. If you don't have permanent absentee ballot, let that happen. Let your local governments have the choice and the option to conduct their elections for special and local only by this method. Even better, let them do any election. This is how it happened in Washington. California's moving in this direction. Utah, you can already do it that way. All of these are strategies to, to, to expand it, but particularly when you do an entire election, you will save a lot of money. In 1998, $3 million saving from going to vote at home uh, in Oregon, and it was a powerful argument, uh, referencing what Andrew said, to get the fiscal conservatives on board as well. So it increases voter turnout dramatically. It uh, makes sure, well, I'll just, See the thing, it eliminates voting lines, um, uh, and it gets voters to participate. And this is kind of what I think is going to be very important. It is increasingly the method of choice where it's allowed for voters over 65. They try it, they love it. There's a green eggs and ham effect to this that is not trivial. So you make the argument that if it's good enough for certain voters, it ought to be good enough for everyone. So uh, if you want more information, please feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thanks for hanging in, everybody. Uh, my name's Chris Pearson. I'm uh, leaving the Vermont House and headed to the Vermont Senate. So I uh, appreciate you, you sticking around and listening before lunch. I am here on behalf of National Popular Vote. This is another bipartisan proposal. National popular vote is a state-based effort to get to a popular vote for president. I would argue this is the most high-profile, dramatic reform that is making its way across the country today. It would have a very powerful impact on voter participation. We see already, uh, as Philip mentioned, in battleground states, you tend to see participation rank about 10% higher than safe states, which is the great majority of us. That number swells when you look at young voters. A national popular vote would create a one-person, one-vote system, something that everybody in this room used to get elected. Uh, all of us got elected because every voter in our district mattered equally. That is not the case in presidential election. Under a national popular vote, every voter in every state would matter in every election and candidate with the most votes would win the election. Yeah. <clears throat> National popular vote, I'm happy to tell you, is over 60% of the way to becoming law of the land. You may have seen the Electoral College has been in the news a whole lot. And you've probably heard somehow the second place candidate is headed to the White House. You may not have heard, but it is equally true, two thirds of the campaign that we just came through, when you look at the general election, Two-thirds of the rallies and the events, and it pairs with ad spending, two-thirds of that money went to six states. Over 90% of the campaign happened in 12 states. For some reason, we have a system where we sit around and watch Florida and Ohio and Virginia debate the future of the country, and we sort of wave our hands from the nosebleed seats. You might think this would have me dislike the Electoral College, but I don't. Let's talk about what the Constitution says around the Electoral College. It is very plain, 
and it doesn't say much. It simply says, each state shall appoint a number of electors as the state legislature thereof may direct. And that's the little nugget and why I'm in the room. And that little nugget matters for every one of you. What I don't like about our current system is the winner take all rule. And that is in fact probably what all of your states have done to award your electors. So let's talk about the winner take all rule. That is the reason that 35 to 38 states are routinely ignored, completely taken for granted. The winner take all rule is the reason that Hillary Clinton doesn't care if she wins California by 2% or 15%. And Trump doesn't care if he wins Texas by 4% or 40%. He's only, they get the same prize. Winner take all is the reason in Vermont, if I wanna get involved in a presidential election, we get in our cars and drive to New Hampshire. Winner take all is the reason small states are completely ignored with the exception of New Hampshire. Winner take all is the reason that people of color just happen to be trapped in safe states. They are not a factor essentially in the battleground states. There's also challenges to governing. So we can spout campaign data all day if you like, but look at what happens when you're sitting in the White House and you're thinking about the next presidential election. Guess what? Battleground states do better, they get more disaster declarations, they get more money when they get them, they get the money faster, they get more no child left behind waivers, they even get more visits from cabinet members. I didn't even know that was a thing, but it's true. And it just tells you that battleground states have a lot of influence and it's not just every four years.